Uh, so good morning, uh, afternoon, and evening, everyone. And uh, my name is Nen Liu. I'm uh, uh, the director of Center for Imam Law here at Macquarie University. So first, I would like to acknowledge that we are today. Today we are uh, on the land of Daru people. Uh, we want to really pay our respect to uh, the elder uh, for their for for the for their custodian of the land and pre past, present, and future. Uh, today, it is my great pleasure uh, to have Professor Elisa Moguera, uh, who is an old friend of mine, and uh, uh, from, uh, from the Slash Clyde Centre for Environmental Law and Governance uh, uh, at, in Scotland uh, to uh, finalise our uh, session one uh, web biodiversity law and governance webinar series, Law and Nature Dialogue. And uh, Elisa is uh, someone that I don't think we need introdu need kind of introduction. Uh, she has been doing wonderful, wonderful biodiversity law and governance work for the past decade also. Uh, first on access and benefit sharing, and then it just grows kind of globally. And I think we are so lucky in the lockdown, especially when we are in lockdown in here in Sydney, to have Elisa today with us to share uh, share some of her latest uh, research findings and interest. Uh, so, without any further uh, further kind of introduction, I will just uh, leave the floor to uh, Elisa, and then uh, once the presentation uh, uh, is 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 uh, done, then we can have some time for Q and A uh, at the end of the session. Okay. Welcome, Melissa. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. And please, maybe if you could give me a heads up when I'm about to go over time, just in case I get caught up in my uh, presentation, that'd be great. Those questions is, are always the best part. So thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to share with you uh, my latest research, but which has very much become very collaborative and increasing interdisciplinary. And so some of the, um, some of the work I will present today is not just my own, but in fact, um, ongoing work um, and very dynamic work that I'm doing with um, um, a big group of colleagues that are part of the One Ocean Hub. This is a global um, research collaboration across marine and social sciences, the law and arts, um, and spans um, more than 20 universities in the UK, South Africa, Namibia, Ghana, but also in the Caribbean and the South Pacific. And it's been an incredible journey. We have been implementing the hub for a couple of years, but we've been working on it for three years uh, in terms of conceptualizing it. And so before starting, I think with the kind of core of the presentation, I just would like to share that even the, the conceiving of this broad um, and ambitious research collaboration has been very much inspired and shaped by um, the relationship between human rights and the marine environment. And in fact, we have you, we're using uh, the connection between human rights and the marine environment as a frame for interdisciplinarity, as a way to bring together the findings from the marine sciences, what we understand about the needs of marine ecosystems, what we understand about ecosystem services, and give them legal weight based on existing international obligations on the basis of their relevance for protecting human rights and the marine environment. And equally, we're bringing in and connecting with the marine science findings, the social science findings, particularly on question of environmental and social, social justice on the coast, but also in relation to maybe communities that have been displaced from the coast and continue to have strong cultural and spiritual, but also livelihoods connection to the sea. Um, and really looking at those findings once again, as evidence of, um, uh, of the relevance uh, and pointing at the shortcomings uh, in the respect of human rights related and interdependent on the marine environment. And maybe what has been really exciting and I will share some insights with you is also how we are engaging more and more um, in art-based research as a way to really open our minds as lawyers, but also as practitioners in, in ocean governance to really understand the complexities of human connections with the oceans, um, the multiple facets to the debates that we have about conservation and sustainable use, and really go beyond maybe a rational approach, also tap into our imagination and empathy to try and envision and co-develop solutions for ocean uh, conservation and sustainable use. And through that, you know, try and find a way for, for human rights to be applied from the bottom up 
and be really filled with local meaning and understanding and, and multiple meanings and, and knowledge systems. So it's been an incredible journey. Um, we started with an intuition and we're still on, on the way towards um, showing to, to what extent um, that understanding of human rights and the marine environment can help us in uh, bringing together interdisciplinary and ideally more and more transdisciplinary research on the ocean. Um, and the whole purpose of the One Ocean Hub were really saying, well, we have multiple and increasing initiatives in ocean science and in ocean governance, and they're all uh, amazing projects, but often they tend to focus on one or, or a limited set of challenges to ocean health. While we know that it is the cumulative pressures on the ocean and the fact that we are not taking all of them into account that really limits our efforts um, to really contribute to conservation and sustainable use. So the ambition of, of the One Ocean Hub is to try and look at connecting, connecting disparate science projects uh, so that we can together better address multiple pressures on the ocean and, and combine and build upon each other's uh, findings, uh, connecting laws from the international to the local level, including customary laws, and of course, working across legal sectors of specialty, um, and connecting society to these efforts in terms of science, in terms of law, and really see how we are effectively responding to a variety of needs, a variety of worldviews, and a variety also of insights into what the ocean is, how it is doing, and how we can better relate to it. Um, so this is just to give you a sense of the arching uh, objective of the project and to really very much emphasize that uh, we are very keen to hear from all those that are working on these issues. Um, we have a really vibrant early career research group. Uh, we're working in a very horizontal way and the connections we've made with other projects have really been part and parcel of how we're trying to work towards this uh, vision of connecting um, the science and the efforts out there uh, so that we can all um, be more effective in advancing our understanding and approaches to sustainable and inclusive ocean governance. So as part of the work of the One Ocean Hub, we've been uh, mapping and working quite closely both with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and at the UN Environment Program, understanding where uh, research, but also policy debates on human rights and the environment are lagging behind in terms of marine environment. Uh, many of you will know that the literature is increasing in understanding human rights in relation to the marine environment, but the reality is there are so many questions where we still really need to advance our understanding of applicable international human rights law and where we need to bring for, for that understanding to bring together uh, growing scientific evidence, um, as well as at advance the legal thinking as to how then the nitty gritty of application uh, of human rights in the particular um, uh, governance system of the ocean can really play a part. Um, so there's quite a lot of work that still needs to be done on procedural environmental rights uh, in the context of marine spatial planning. Um, you may be aware, maybe if, um, last week we attended that amazing winter summer school on human rights and the environment the UNEP and the Global Network um, on Human Rights and the Environment organized about how we are more and more aware of human rights violations in the creation and management of protected areas. For marine protected areas, we have even added barriers to the real realization of procedural rights. First of all, the science is limited. Um, it's quite difficult to engage with. Um, and in all events, marine spatial planning is still a process that's being developed in some countries, not all of them. So in other countries, we have very disparate and even more disconnected processes um, for decision making on activities that directly or indirectly will impact on the ocean. So being able to effectively participate uh, in those decision making processes raises a host of challenges that are much higher uh, than we have faced on land. And we know that even on land, for how much our research is very advanced in terms of practices, uh, we're far from having a vast array of, of um, good, uh, good practice case studies. Um, procedural rights are extremely important, um, as has been um, experienced on land as well uh, during the time of the pandemic, where many consultations have migrated oh, online, explaining. where governments have also somehow um, fast-tracked or um, 
somehow um, uh, change some of the usual approaches to um, uh, authorizing uh, development activities um, and where particularly indigenous peoples and local communities, but also activists have just faced out of a sudden a whole set of new challenges in effectively participating in decision making. And uh, within the hub, but also the UN Environment Programme and FAO have been documenting very quickly uh, the challenges and the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment has also been very quick in highlighting all the new challenges that have arisen in the context of the pandemic. Um, all of that is compounded uh, in the context of the marine environment by a push for advancing the blue economy. Um, quite a few countries have adopted blue economy policies um, at the, as part of the One Ocean Hub we've been mapping and trying to understand to what extent blue economies are effectively framed in sustainable terms, to what extent they've been developed uh, through inclusive processes, and how they map onto SDGs and which, which SDGs maybe are left behind. And unfortunately, in many cases, blue economy policies don't give enough clarity as to the guarantees or a vision for sustainability. Uh, they're very patchy into which sectors they address and often they not only um, create an, an environment for accelerated development, but from a legal perspective, they also create expectations for foreign investors, which may be then protected by international, um, international investment law to the point that national governments may then find their hands tied in trying to balance um, economic interests with social and cultural interests. And for instance, their own efforts to protect the marine environment or protect vulnerable communities. Um, and I'm very grateful to colleagues from the International Institute for Environment and Develop De De Development who carried out an initial mapping of what are the risks arising from blue economy policy in terms of international investment law. Um, and what their conclusion is that we need much more research at the intersection of human rights, protection of the marine environment and international investment law as most of the, the, the vast, vast majority of scholarship and case law is really all focused on terrestrial um, investment as opposed to marine. So a huge gap in understanding there. Um, also linked to procedural rights, um, it's been a very interesting journey for me to um, really be involved um, in uh, global and regional consultations that the UN Environment Programme organized on environmental human rights defenders and realize how also in that sector, we are very much focused on land defenders. Um, we, we had very little representation of ocean related defenders, um, particularly the whole small scale fishery sector, uh, which is struggling to, um, to effectively participate in decisions affecting their human rights. Um, they are still not quite seen or not as visible as other environmental human rights defenders. And for that reason, they're not receiving the support and the, and the understanding uh, that other environmental human rights defenders might. Um, and so this is another area, not only of awareness raising, but really where we're trying to understand what are the implications uh, legally and practically of um, uh, expanding the notion of environmental human rights defenders to ocean defenders. Um, we know that existing international uh, obligations relating to everyone's right to health, water, food and culture life, they're all clearly dependent on a healthy ocean. We have the science um, to tell us how important the ocean is for, for the air we breathe, for the water cycle, for nutrition and fisheries, and we know how those multiple threats to the oceans are very much undermining the capacity of the ocean to provide all those essential services to us. But we haven't yet worked out what that means in terms of state obligations. Um, I think maybe the area of the right to food is the one where we have had more uh, work um, and former UN special rapporteurs on the right to food have reflected particularly in one key report on fisheries. But if we think about the state, how advanced it is our thinking in relation to right to food and agriculture, uh, you know, with the pinnacle of the notion of agroecology, well, we don't even have a similar term for, uh, for fisheries. We're working still with the notion of an ecosystem approach to fisheries. And of course, increasingly a human rights based approach to fisheries. But the reality is that these two approaches are not yet fully 
um, connected, even if in theory, the both, both of them are very much aligned and working towards um, shared goals. But the practice and the understanding of an ecosystem approach to fisheries and that of a human rights based approach to fisheries are still um, distinct. And even that um, distinction in people's minds and backgrounds and activities means that we are not um, we are not advanced enough in the understanding and in the practice of applying them uh, in a mutually supportive way. Uh, and I think that is even more important for the human right to health. Um, this is an area where my, one of my colleagues, a PhD researcher at the Strathclyde Center for Environmental Law and Governance, is um, advancing the understanding of how the science base um, around the importance of marine biodiversity for health, how does that then how is that translated into our understanding of state obligations to protect our uh, health in the context of decisions on marine biodiversity or how we bring considerations of marine biodiversity into health related decision making. So it's quite an important area and particularly if we think about more maybe remote issues uh, in connection to the protection of marine biodiversity impacts in the high seas or even from deep seabed mining. You can see how we're stretching the imagination, I think, of those working for decades on the right um, to human health. Um, of course, an area where instead we have a lot of work uh, and quite advanced is the protection of human rights of indigenous peoples um, and, and possibly because indigenous peoples worldviews are much more connected than our own and their notion of territories very much looks at them and understands intimately the, the connections between ocean and land, uh, between water and carbon cycles. And so as part of that, I think that is an area in international law where we have more advancement of the understanding of, of the relevance um, of the ocean for the protection of human rights of indigenous peoples. Um, but within that, uh, we have other groups, uh, local knowledge holders, small scale fishers, who to some extent are following in the steps of indigenous peoples and trying to look for similar or um, comparable legal guarantees for their own human rights um, in the context of um, uh, marine resources and areas. And within each of these groups, we have issues related to rural women's rights and um, children's rights and persons with disability and the rights of persons with disabilities. All of this needs still to be unpacked um, in as far as uh, marine resources and areas is concerned. Um, within the cluster, um, I think what we have realized, particularly with the um, ethnographic research that colleagues have conducted in, in South Africa and Ghana and Namibia is how a big blind spot is intangible cultural heritage. How, for how much we have an understanding of how human rights of indigenous peoples come into play in decisions on conservation or sustainable use of the ocean, um, the understanding and the consideration of intangible cultural heritage is really um, not there. Environmental impact assessments have no entry point for that consideration. Even in terms of people's understanding and awareness, we're, we're very, very far from a minimum uh, level of um, engagement. And in fact, that is where I think we're, we're really advancing research, both from an anthropological and sociological perspective, but also very much using arts to really convey and again, make, um, support uh, different sectors of society to um, understand what intangible cultural heritage is, how it may relate, and in some cases even overlap with uh, modern science and how it can then be uh, incorporated in the already very complex uh, balancing exercise that relates to the conservation of the ocean and sustainable use. Within this, um, you may be aware that, for instance, SDG 14b on small scale um, fisheries um, calls not only for access to marine resources, but also for access to markets. And that's another bit of thinking that's uh, falling a bit behind. Um, of course, it also um, relates to other areas of the law related to trade and to health, for instance, and for how much it's very much part and parcel of how we can protect and fully uh, also support the full realization of human rights of indigenous peoples, local knowledge holders, and small scale fishers. From a legal perspective, we are far from having a very clear understanding of um, which international rules come into play and how they need to be interpreted in, light, in the light of human rights. 
Um, very quickly, two, two other areas um, to discuss and where we're just starting to do work. Uh, you may be aware that um, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has launched a process to develop a comment uh, on the human rights of children to, to a healthy environment. There's a lot of emphasis on climate change. Um, unfortunately, however, there doesn't seem to be any champion for making sure that the comment will also address uh, the connection between children's rights and a healthy ocean or understanding in what ways the ocean may bring uh, particular challenges, um, if nothing else, in terms of our still limited um, a scientific understanding of life in the ocean and interrelations between life in the ocean and life on land. Um, and so there's an opportunity as this work gets launched and um, I think a, a great global alliances have already been formed on children's right to a healthy environment, uh, as well as the incredible social movements related to climate change litigation to make sure that the ocean is not forgotten and left behind. And I think for many of you, maybe in the South Pacific, that might seem uh, a bit surprising. Uh, certain, in certain culture, the ocean is so central that you, that you wouldn't even imagine that in others instead, it is a bit of an afterthought. It's something that comes after land. And, and there is the aspect, I think, of um, cross-regional learning that might be very important um, in this context, as well as across all the human rights issues I've mentioned. Um, and finally, the area of business and human rights. Um, I think we have a plethora of standards and activities internationally, um, as well as transnationally. And we're starting to see a bit of an interest around um, uh, business responsibility to respect human rights in the marine context. But we're really lagging behind in terms of fully understanding both state obligations and business responsibility in key economic sectors um, of the blue economy. Uh, one conversation I've had um, with colleagues is that for how much we're working on um, human rights in the context of small scale fisheries, we, we don't really talk enough about human rights in the context of large scale fisheries and how in fact the biggest threat to small scale fishers human rights come from that tension and conflict with large scale fishing or from the negative impacts of large scale fishing operations. And so in a way we can't really expect progress on human rights unless we also work with, uh, with the companies involved in large scale fisheries. Um, and as I mentioned before, the whole aspect of international investment law um, across all the sectors involved in the blue economy is an area where, where we need a lot uh, of work. So this was just to give you a sense, I guess an overview of all the areas of, of work that are out there. Um, and the fact that my own understanding has very much evolved thanks to some of the work that has been pioneered by colleagues from Rhodes University and others uh, in South Africa. They have used um, theater as an um, art-based uh, research approach to co-produce um, an understanding of how different communities in South Africa relate to the ocean, what are the conflicts they have identified, the injustices they have experienced, and their multiple connections to the ocean spanning across generations, different uh, uh, religions, but also different um, economic sectors. Um, and what has been really uh, interesting in seeing this process, which is very iterative, um, it starts with uh, the development of a play that um, researchers um, and community members who become co-researchers prepare and reiterate. And then at every performance, um, with different kinds of audiences, including decision makers, but also marine scientists, marine educators, um, children, um, EIA consultants. At each performance, there's a facilitated discussion with the researchers and community members. And, the, and that is an, another layer of research, which is then incorporated in a successive version of the play. So it's a very living process to um, to understand what the real challenges are and then for, for the lawyers working in the project to reflect on what kind of insights it provides in terms of the human rights at stake. But it's also a process that provides us opportunities for thinking about how we practice human rights, how we engage in human rights discussions and how we can in different ways use the play to achieve multiple um, activities that can contribute to understanding of human rights and maybe progress towards their protection. And it's an opportunity for researchers to reflect upon their own work. And thanks to this uh, process, which has now been ongoing for two years, we have much tighter 
uh, synergies in the work of our marine scientists and, and social scientists and really understanding how they can work together towards the creation of new marine protected areas, how they need to work together when new developments are proposed that may threaten ocean health. Um, but there's also synergies and new alliances among communities that hadn't worked with each other before. And for instance, um, small scale fishing communities in South Africa tended to be um, to address their own concerns in isolated ways. And they're now working much more strategically, almost reaching a, a nationwide um, collaboration. And in fact, from uh, the Empathiater process, um, South African researchers have been able to create a um, um, coastal justice network through a WhatsApp group, which was a kind of an immediate response to the pandemic. Uh, related lockdowns and um, the stopping of a sudden of opportunities to meet to participate in decisions and the whatsapp group has really evolved into this um, very responsive and insightful network of um, knowledge solidarity um, understanding uh, small scale fishers needs understanding how different communities may need to um, come together to address common issues um, and bringing together, for instance, local legal aid NGOs um, and knowledge from across the hub to respond to the questions that are uh, arising um, as communities understand which decisions are taking place and where they're excluded or their concerns are not heard. Um, but the, the, the performance also has, a, has a, um, an opportunity to um, to work as a tool for raising awareness, building the capacity, even training for decision makers, judges, enforcement officers, um, and potentially parliamentarians. And in fact, in, in previous uh, themes that this methodology has been used, it has led to legal reform. So a very um, exciting uh, area of work, I think interdisciplinary, a transdisciplinary area of work that really brings to light those maybe more abstract questions that I just shared with you um, about human rights and the marine environment. Um, together with this, and again, to really um, ensure that the legal research is um, targeted to the right questions, uh, we're doing quite a lot of work uh, mapping legal questions vis-a-vis -vis the empirical work that many socioecologists and anthropologists are doing in South Africa um, in relation to environmental and social justice. Um, and some of their findings, earlier findings, have been confirmed in the Empathiater production as well. Um, and so we're trying to understand what questions arise from that understanding in terms of um, legal perspectives and the interaction between human rights and the environment. Um, a lot of issues have been um, identified in the context of environmental impact assessments and the need for strategic environmental assessments. That's really one of the um, crucial points at which we see both um, the needs of the for the protection of the ocean and multiple human rights being um, ignored or not sufficiently taken into account from a procedural and substantive perspective. Um, and quite a few insights so for for the lawyers on the project to work around understanding how we can move away from that practice of uh, impact assessments that have already a predetermined set of options how we can bring in um, historical data on continuous uh, injustices, cultural heritage, but also climate change, science, and that um, multiplier effect that it has on multiple threats. Um, understanding of, of where the science is still um, advancing, which is about the deep seas and their role for our well being, uh, and really moving away from that kind of damage control approach to instead a collaborative identification and co-development of solutions where we can really build and, and learn from multiple uh, worldviews and, and systems of knowledge. Um, and also what are the conditions, uh, the legal conditions as, as well as the practical conditions for um, indigenous peoples to withhold pre free prior informed consent um, and really clarifying that across um, for decision makers, for others, for the scientists involved in the decision making um, so that the process is really genuine and not just one of um, rubber stamping. Now, um, one area where we have made more uh, advances in the project has really been looking at the human rights of small scale fishers, uh, which may include indigenous peoples. Um, and one interesting area for us of reflection has been working on the one hand quite closely with the Food and Agriculture Organization 
on the voluntary guidelines for sustainable small scale fisheries, where we have a plethora of uh, support the FAO is offering to countries to advance um, the protection of small scale fishers. And the more recent um, and more kind of more squarely human rights um, instrument of the de UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants, which also includes um, small scale fishers. And just trying to understand how these two instruments, which on the face of it has have shared objectives and a shared um, agenda in what ways from a legal perspective, they highlight slightly different but very compatible um, aspects of the finer work related to uh, human rights and the marine environment in the small scale fishing context. And of course, it's important to understand how um, the two processes for developing uh, these two instruments were different. And of course, on FAO, we come from that um, incredible expertise in fisheries, a very, um, I think, um, collaborative approach, which led to consensus adoption of the fisheries guidelines, and very much a perspective of um, fisheries management uh, in the context of human rights of small scale fishers. And so, as I was saying, that mindset of an ecosystem approach to fisheries and understanding the nitty gritty of how we make decisions in the fishery sector, fishery, fisheries licensing and uh, assessments and monitoring and all of that. Um, and FAO has been able to leverage a significant amount of financial and technical resources to support the implementation of the guidelines um, at the national level. Um, on the other hand, for the Declaration on the Rights of Peasants, um, there were certain differences among states, uh, majority voting, both at the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly. Um, and that just to show that once we engage more squarely with human rights concepts and understanding of uh, state obligations, and we try to do so, which I think is the key feature of the Declaration, from the perspective of human rights holders um, and their understanding of um, their worldview and how human rights can help realize that worldview, we are really touching upon uh, politically sensitive and sometimes legally complex aspects where um, certain states at least are uh, hesitant to fully embrace. But even with that maybe uh, slightly less um, uh, strong political backing for the declaration. The declaration has been adopted and has really important, even conceptually and practically, very important elements that can contribute to uh, also to the implementation of the FAO guidelines, which, which is quite less and uh, much less controversial. Um, and so some of the work that we have been doing is really trying to understand how the two instruments come together and add value to each other. Um, as I said, a lot of the issues are common, but the ways in which they're framed is slightly different. And particularly, I think, in the context of the FAO guidelines, we're really looking at good practices, ways in which management of fisheries can be more responsive um, to the needs to protect the rights of small scale fishers, but is kind of glossing over more structural barriers to the real protection and realization of those rights. Whereas when we read the declaration, we see how um, we understand that multiple grounds and longstanding experience of injustices and discrimination that small scale fishers and other peasants have faced. Um, and we need, you know, there's a very clear sense of needing to look for um, where uh, biases and discrimination still persists in, you know, in public authorities, in, in scientists and others who are involved um, in the fishery sector in our case, um, and really understanding the various barriers. So it's the point of view is that of human rights holders trying and not managing to secure their rights. So that very fine understanding of the barriers into the system, um, as well as a, a kind of more rounded understanding of, of the worldview of the idea of a very different system of food production than the one we uh, that dominates, um, unfortunately, all our um, realities, and how that uh, idea of a different system is really what is uh, clashing um, and 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 leads to several violations of human rights. And so, what's interesting here is that, of course, these are two sides of the same debate, and the FAO guidelines uh, might maybe uh, look at more practical. 
uh, smaller steps for advancing protection of the rights, uh, but they have the merit of doing so in a very accessible way to uh, managers and decision makers. And so they speak more directly to those um, crucial actors who are very much at the front line of ensuring respect for the rights of small scale fishers, but who may not be trained or have sufficient um, finer understanding of human rights. And so in that sense, the guidelines do the work of translating and making something accessible and immediately operational um, for those in those positions. Uh, but of course, there is more to the change that's needed um, than uh, that. And this is where the declaration really comes in and provides that wider understanding of the change, chance, uh, changes that are needed. Um, and, and as I said, I mean, one of the key issues, for instance, is how we define small scale fishers at the national level. There's no international definition, and this is very much because we need a contextual understanding of a very diverse and dynamic sector. And we need a participatory process very much to, for the sector itself to contribute to that definition. Um, and this is really one of the very tricky um, aspects and you know in a very very much entry point um, aspect for then ensuring protection at the national level um, and we have evidence of how uh, subjective or slightly um, ideological definitions or definitions that have not been based on a truly and sufficiently participatory process have in fact um, worked against the purposes of both instruments and lead to exclusionary practices to precluding protection for particular groups of small scale fishers. Um, I'm aware of the time, so maybe I'll go a bit faster here, but just to mention that both instruments reflect on questions of tenure. Um, I think in the Peasants' Rights Declaration, there is clearly a much pro more prominent land focused um, mindset. And yet um, um, there are elements across the, the Peasants' Declaration where we see the interlinks between land and water and the importance of fishing grounds um, and the same approach to the recognition of customary land tenure, which FAO has done um, a lot of work. And so once again, we have the, um, on the one hand in the FAO guidelines, uh, an understanding of tenure as part and parcel of the ecosystem approach. And on the other hand, maybe on the, on the peasants rights, um, an understanding of um, how tenure links to cultural rights and identity for small scale fishers and others. And, and again, the two, are very much um, complementary visions and, and just gives us a sense of how we need to understand um, the different sides of the debate and, and find ways for them to, um, to talk to each other and understand each other. Um, also in terms of safeguards, we're, we're back to the usual safeguards, which we are familiar with in the context of, for instance, um, uh, indigenous people's human rights in relation to their natural resources. But these are safeguards that have also been identified, for instance, for rural women and, and indigenous and local knowledge holders that have to do with impact assessment, consultation or consent requirements and fair and equitable benefit sharing. Um, and as we were saying from our um, earlier work in South Africa, these are both essential cornerstone from a legal perspective. And this is exactly where in practice things tend to go wrong. And so really understanding what are the barriers and the blind spots at, at the practical level means that as lawyers, we need to question much more and think much more creatively around how these safeguards can really play the role we expect as opposed to uh, work against uh, their purposes, which unfortunately is the reality experience um, uh, across the world. Um, so this is just to say that we're continuing the work with FAO and trying to bring the insights from uh, the empirical research into the guidance documents the FAO prepares to support the application of the guidelines to guide lawmakers, but also those interested in changing the law um, to question whether the national uh, instruments are in line with international guidelines and are in line with a human rights based approach or not. Uh, and it's been quite an incredible experience to see how our colleagues uh, from sociology and anthropology have been able to bring um, directly the voices of small scale fishers in conversation uh, with FAO experts and, and what else we have learned from that research that has helped us to give a, a much more nuanced understanding of what it's needed from the legal perspective to respond to the real challenges out there. 
Um, maybe could could you let me know how much time I have left? Um, uh, you can, uh, yeah, Lisa, you can talk uh, another, let's say, 10, 10 minutes, maybe? Let's, 10 minutes. Uh, let's, okay, let's leave 10 minutes for questions, because I'm sure there will be lots of questions from the audience. Right, okay, so I'll try to be faster than 10 then. I think the last part of the presentation is actually really about one human right, which I think um, has not received um, as much attention. And again, where I think that the literature is quite limited, but which is finally really taking um, its stride. And this is the human right to science, which we already find in the Universal Declaration. Um, it's clearly legally binding and enshrined in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, as well as in all uh, regional human rights uh, binding instruments. But for a long time, uh, we really didn't know what this right entailed, both in its own content and in, term of, in terms of state obligations. And it's really been initially with a 2012 report of the UN Special Rapporteur on Culture, and just last year, a general comment um, from the uh, Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that we get a full sense of what the human right to science means and, and what state obligations are. And I think my, uh, the argument I want to develop with you is that the human right to science is crucial for us to understand those obligations in international environmental law that often lag behind in implementation. And those have to do with capacity building and technology transfer, financial cooperation, generally just scientific cooperation. And we see them, I think, in ancillary way compared to uh, obligations to protect and due diligence. But the reality is that particularly for the ocean, where the science is still not advanced enough for us to know more about the ocean than outer space, these obligations are crucial. And they very much um, make or break how we can effectively fulfill obligation to conserve marine biodiversity and to use, use it sustainably. Uh, but also to make sure we have sufficient understanding of where we succeed or fail in our conservation and sustainable use efforts um, in a way that prevents um, human rights violations and then eventually leads to real contributions to multiple sustainable development goals. Um, equally, the human right to science is very relevant for the recognition, acknowledgement and integration of indigenous and local knowledge of indigenous peoples. Um, this is an area where in theory we have sufficient clarity but I still think that once we think about integrating traditional knowledge in global science assessments and in global decision making processes, the human right to science provides, I think, additional element of clarity about legal obligations and cautions that we need to take. Just to mention very quickly that we have taken this very much on board also for how we're managing the hub and we had developed a code of conduct where we're trying ourselves to be very attentive to any opportunity for um, uh, exclusion or unfair treatment as part of our scientific collaboration. And in fact, at the very beginning, when, when we um, conceived the collaboration, many colleagues said, well, you know, but these and these things went wrong in previous collaboration. We're not going to do this if this is going to happen again. And that just gave us a very clear sense of how you really need to uh, practice what you preach um, within research projects. And in fact, change in research practices is probably a precondition for seeing a change in then decision-making process, processes where the evidence produced by scientists and researchers will be used. Um, of course, this is a very much an ongoing learning process. Uh, we're trying to capture the lessons learned and, and we're very keen for other researchers to um, comment and, and use and feed feedback on what the code of conduct says and, and what we're doing about it. And it's very much been inspired on the one hand by um, my own work on, on international law and benefit sharing, uh, but also South African colleagues work on, on fairness and equity across different areas of the environment, work that has been done in terms of fair partnerships with communities in research, um, and just generally the understanding of experiences of all involved in what went wrong in previous research collaborations uh, and just documenting that and, and committing to uh, not repeating those mistakes, even if they weren't our own, um, was a huge step forward, uh, I think, for all colleagues involved. So this is just to give you a quick sense of what's in the, in the code and just the fact that one line of research that's very active um, among the ones we're pursuing is really thinking about our own role and the role of ocean research funders 
in supporting the protection of human rights, um, both in terms of our own practices, how we relate to um, knowledge co-producers, um, and also how, what are the conditions that we need to really be able um, to do this work and how we can target our research efforts and define our research questions um, from this perspective. So finally, the, the final few things I wanted to share, the final few thoughts is a recent paper I've just um, published online and on which I welcome very much comments, which is uh, what are the implications of human rights in the context of the ongoing UN negotiations um, for a new legally binding um, uh, instrument on marine biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, you may be aware that those negotiations are quite advanced. In fact, UN negotiations have been going on for more than a decade. Um, we have one session remaining of the ones mandated by the General Assembly, which has just been postponed to early 2022. But from the perspective of an international environmental lawyer, the, the current draft we have is quite low in ambition. It's certainly it's very hard to see how it can really help us to tackle more effectively the multiple threats to ocean health in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And there are many elements that just from a purely international environmental law perspective are disappointing in where we are with the negotiations. But you know we have to remain hopeful and find ways forward and, and part of this research I've been um, involved has really been thinking about how understanding the relation of human rights and the marine environment and maybe particularly using the human right to science can help us to find ways to show that states negotiating this treaty already have existing international obligations from their human rights treaties and environmental treaties, particularly the ecosystem approach ones uh, that points to a very clear direction in the negotiations. They have implications for how you create new international law uh, in this particular context. Um, and of course, I mean, while I was thinking about this, it was really helpful to see how the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Environment, David Boy, called in his 22, 2020 biodiversity report for appropriate considerations of human rights in the BBNJ negotiations. And also this general comment on the right to science very much emphasized that whenever countries are developing new treaties, they should not forget their human rights obligations. But of course, from, from these general statements to, well, how does that link at all to creating marine protected areas in the high seas? How does that link to deep sea bioprospecting? The jump between human rights and that very specific and technical area of negotiation under the law of the sea um, is not obvious. And we need to connect the dots and find clear legal arguments to connect existing international obligations with their implications for the creation of new uh, international law. Um, some some, some uh, dimensions of human rights have come through the negotiations already, I think particularly in terms of um, the human rights of indigenous peoples and local knowledge holders. Uh, but I think there's a deeper understanding of what this means or what it means to enhance international cooperation to protect um, marine areas beyond national jurisdiction, what it means for human rights at large. Um, and also uh, taking the human right to science, what are the obligations of states to ensure that we really have a much more effective and equitable in terms of global north, global south relations in advancing ocean science? Because at the end of the day, we have only 10 states in the world who can finance um, deep sea research. And those 10 states are of course calling the shots um, in who participates, what kind of um, objectives we're setting for that research. And, and that research is what then will, will be essential for making decisions on conservation or sustainable use. And so everybody else, th those cruises tend to be international, but of course there, there is a huge power imbalance and um, a whole set of other capacity um, gaps that need to be acknowledged and need to be addressed also from a human rights perspective. So one, one thing I'm trying to explore in this paper is if we acknowledge that we have, which is very much on the table, that disparity in access um, to ocean science and in advancing ocean science, um, what, does it, what are the human rights implications of states um, failing to comply with their existing law of the sea obligations on scientific cooperation, on capacity building and technology transfer. And this is really crucial because in the BBNJ negotiations, we're trying to advance and provide more details on those um, existing obligations under the law of the sea convention. 
And yet some of the positions are that, well, these are not even legally binding obligations or they remain very general and this new instrument will not confirm or really um, define what the legally binding part, what the real content of obligation is in this um, context. And so bringing human rights in may, may, may show that, well, actually you have, this is binding not only from a law of the sea perspective, but in fact also from an international human rights law perspective, because the, the implications of not advancing on those obligations have um, impacts on human rights holders. Um, the other, I think, key aspect that I'm really interested in is just to connect in our minds legally, but also practically the fact that whatever happens in areas beyond national jurisdiction, which may feel very remote from us, is connected in scientifically proven way to particular states and particular communities who will be more affected than others uh, by our decisions in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And so the science uh, on ecological connectivity between areas within and beyond national jurisdiction is essential here. And more evidence has been shared um, in, in New York at the UN about how migratory species and currents really show that some areas of the planet are more uh, vulnerable to uh, the impacts that arise from our decisions in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And that means that we can trace through the evidence base also certain human rights holders who may be more exposed to negative impacts of our poor decisions uh, on marine areas beyond national jurisdiction. But more generally, our understanding of the ecosystem services of the deep seas um, is still evolving. And so our evidence base to really understand who's gonna benefit on whose human rights are gonna be negatively impacted by decisions um, on the high seas or on the deep seabed is still evolving and we need to be mindful of that. And in fact, we have international human rights law obligations to make that a priority, a priority for advancing the science and therefore putting into practice those law of the sea obligations relating to uh, scientific cooperation and capacity building and technology transfer and make a very clear link about identifying what are the greatest needs for progress in science, in ocean science, vis-a-vis -vis the basic human, sorry, basic economic, social and cultural rights that may be a stake. So this is one key connection in terms of understanding the importance of the human right to science and more generally the human rights implications of our efforts to protect marine biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, and, um, and, and it has to do with one dimension of the human right to science, which is an obligation for states to set priorities for research that really respond to the highest needs um, from the perspective of other uh, human rights. So this may sound quite um, abstract, but then what I've tried to do in the rest of the paper is really trying to understand how this then can be um, specified in more particular um, elements of the draft text, uh, which have to do with the, uh, the terms that the negotiators are very familiar with. And so for instance, in terms of uh, obligations related to area-based management tools, including marine protected areas and environmental impact assessments. We've had some discussion and still controversy around whether or not uh, those um, tools and these areas of the agreement need to take into account economic, social and cultural issues. And here, of course, if we take bring in international human rights law obligation existing ones um, for the states who are negotiating we say well actually your due diligence standard here needs to be read in conjunction with your human rights obligations and really understand that we're not just talking about undefined economic social and cultural issues but really looking at whether your decisions on protected areas or the balancing of interest in EIAs takes into account, identifies which human rights might be at stake, which implications there may be potentially due to ecological connectivity or otherwise our understanding of ecosystem services and make that part and, part and parcel of that decision. Um, I think crucially, there's still controversy as to how this treaty will address strategic environmental assessments. And those I think are essential for that understanding um, of human rights impacts as well, um, and particularly in the light of climate change. Um, we have some draft provisions on consultation and participation, but of course, moving from a very generic, well, stakeholder engagement to are we really consulting and giving a voice to relevant human rights holders is a big step forward. And more generally, human, human rights standards can help 
to make those provisions uh, more aligned with relevant human rights law obligations. Um, and finally, I think that there's a lot of scope to use and explore how bringing together international human rights law into this context on the basis of the ecosystem approach and the human right to science can really help us understand the responsibilities the international community has as a whole and what kind of global institutions we need for states collectively to be able to deliver on those obligations. Um, so I leave it at that for now. I'm not sure how many PB&J experts are in the, in the room, but hopefully if there are questions, I can go in further, um, in further detail on this. And thanks so much for bearing with me for a pretty long uh, presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Elisa, for your fascinating uh, presentation, and which is uh, I see as a, as a as a detailed, in depth kind of uh, regime interaction between human rights law and the marine biodiversity. So, uh, unfortunately, we don't really have that much time. I think <laughs> because the session is set as one hour, and it will just automatically end uh, in four minutes time. So, I, I guess we could probably take maybe one, a maximum two burning questions uh, with short answers and who, yes, Margaret, please go ahead. Thank you, Niangu, and, and thank you for organizing such a wonderful seminar, Elisa, uh, tour de force, incredible amount of uh, work that you're doing in the One Ocean Hub. I really have to take a deep breath. <laughs> so thank you for sharing all of that work with us. And I'm sure um, other people will have questions as well. My question really focuses on the blue economy. I was really intrigued by your comments about that. Um, you were limiting your comments to the investment law framework, but obviously the blue economy has a whole range of other um, ambitions. Um, and I wondered if you see the human rights framework as um, important in um, shaping or constraining activities within the blue economy. And I'm thinking particularly of, of um, organizations like the World Bank that do profess to adopt um, human rights frameworks in other areas of their policies. And do you think that there's a, a call for that type of, um, of action in the sphere of the blue economy? Thanks. Hi, Margaret, and it's lovely to see you. I wish we, we met in person somewhere at some point. Um, yeah, no, that's a very, very good point. Uh, and I think we haven't quite yet done any work there, maybe particularly because the, the countries we're focusing in are not necessarily facing World Bank projects. But I think that is definitely one, one side to the question. Um, and it has to do also with like local uh, business investment, uh, not just foreign investment. Uh, but the role of, I think, foreign donors in blue economies in one way or other, as well as international institutions and international financial institutions is crucial there. There's been a lot of work done on the human rights side, but not necessarily maybe applied yet to the blue economy context. So I think it'll be really interesting to connect that area of research, which has been quite advanced on human rights obligation of international financial institutions there. Uh, so yeah, thanks for, for raising that. And I'll actually have to check with colleagues if we haven't somehow not come across um, concrete cases uh, to, to apply that. But I, if, I should say I've other, been um, working a little bit with the World Bank on, on some of the blue economy. Um, oh, activities. that's great. Yeah, and we have done capacity building that's bringing in the FAO approaches. In fact, the FAO has helped with, it, with that as well as the International Seabed Authority and the UN. Division for Ocean Affairs and the Law of the Sea. So I'm pleased to say there's regime interaction going on right now in the blue economy space, and I'm waiting to see how that will impact um, on all of the types of marine issues that you've identified, including the human rights ones. Yeah, thank all right. You thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I don't think we have any time for anything <laughs> at this stage. We have less than one minute, but I'm sure. So first, at least we'll be recorded. Uh, so uh, please check our uh, center's uh, YouTube channel for, for more uh, thoughts and discussions with Elisa. And also, before we go, uh, I would like to uh, just make another, another, another announcement uh, for our, on behalf of our, our center, because uh, this is the last webinar of our session one webinar series. And, uh, and next week, we will be having a webinar very exciting week of three days of global dialogue on biodiversity and governance uh, com annual conference and also with a pre-dialogue uh, session uh, features uh, Dr. Michelle Ling on the IPES IPCC report and our, uh, lob, our, our webinar series will resume in August and we will welcome uh, 
Professor Holly Dor Dorimus from UC Berkeley in August and September, uh, Liz Fisher from Oxford. And then uh, October will be uh, delivered by uh, Nila Faro from NUS. And then we finalize our session two webinar series uh, by our annual lecture to be delivered by uh, Ms. Elizabeth Marema, the CBD Secretary, uh, Executive Secretary of the CBD Secretary. So just watch this space. And uh, I hope I look forward to seeing some of you next week. And then let's kind of keep this dialogue going on. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Sorry about that. No worries.